We'll be talking about Thanksgiving a little bit, kind of, sort of, this morning. Now we're taking a break. We're going through the book of Matthew, looking at the red letters of Christ. And, uh, you know, come the holidays, I always feel the, the pressure to do a theme sermon. And so, uh, so I kind of fight it throughout the week, and then I always kind of give in. But Thanksgiving is one of those holidays, it's kind of just a bleep. You know, you have a lot of people who are all involved and, and like the Halloween thing and decorate it all out for that. And then some of you are itching for Christmas. Does anyone have their Christmas tree up already? I'm praying for you. Uh, I'm, <laughs> that's left over from Halloween. The bats from the Halloween. But, uh, you know, people are just eager and anxious to start decorating and hanging things up and, and just kind of blowing through Thanksgiving and Thanksgiving is, is actually one of my, my favorite holidays. And it's not just because, well, maybe it is the food. I don't know. You know, uh, I'm not a big dessert guy, but Thanksgiving, pumpkin pie with whipped cream. And actually, it's probably more whipped cream with pumpkin pie. I'm like, if you can see the pie, you don't have enough whipped cream. I mean, it's just and, uh, turkey and stuffing and gravy. Oh, oh, I'm getting hungry. I didn't have breakfast this morning. But it's just one of those days where we got to pause. You know, we live in a society that's so fast. And like I said, we're already, you know, already we're announcing Christmas things. And then it'll be New Year's. And then it'll be, you know, January. And this year will just be gone. And so a, a holiday that's designed for us to pause and give thanks. You know, 1 Thessalonians tells us, it says, And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. In Christ Jesus for you. God wants us to be thankful. And, uh, you know, we have it so good. We, we really do. And it's easy for us to get sort of negative Nelly. And it's funny because, you know, at Christmas, you know, it come the lights. Because I drag my heels. I'm trying, you know, every year I try to convince the wife. I said, you know, let's put up the tree on Christmas Eve. We'll make Christmas Eve special, so we'll put the tree up on Christmas Eve. And she says, no. And so as soon as Thanksgiving is over, she'll be after me, and I'll drag my heels to try to get up there. And so my wife, you know, over the years, has called me Scrooge, you know, because especially this time of year, you start getting Christmas music, and I'm like, it's too early, and it, you know, it's like, you know, what do you want for Christmas? I don't know what I want. You know, I, I, this is all those things. So, she, you know, she calls me Scrooge. And, uh, but I was thinking, you know, I think there's a whole lot more Thanksgiving Scrooges and then there are Christmas Scrooges. Right? Just, just blow past the holidays. It's not important. And, and, and you know, it changes too over the years because, you know, uh, especially when you have young families and, and everyone, you know, is everyone coming over to your place and then it changes and now all of a sudden you're going to other people and then maybe, you know, maybe you're not going to anyone in the house and maybe you're, you're alone. And, and so all these things kind of play into this uh, dislike for Thanksgiving. And I think part of it, too, is, you know, so much has gone on in the world in the last couple of years that I think we almost feel like we're entitled to be miserable. I remember talking to a, a lady, and uh, she was talking about all the stress, and she goes, I'm going to have my nervous breakdown. And so I started talking to her, and she was like, no, 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 you understand. I deserve it. You're not going to stop it. I'm going to have my nervous breakdown, and I deserve it, and I'm going to have it. And she was just kind of reveling in that misery that's there. And I know it's easy. You know, we turn around, I just, you know, some of you feel differently about the election that went through, and maybe that's affected your mood. Uh, I just topped off our fuel tank and got the bill from that, and that adjusted my attitude a little bit. You know, every week look at the grocery prices, and uh, last week took the family out to a movie and got popcorn and all that, and almost had to take out a small loan to do that. Now I know we don't go to the movies. I mean, there's a lot to be miserable about if you really want to. So this morning, if, if you're here this morning and... Talk about, well, Pastor, you got to talk about Thanksgiving. I got nothing to be thankful for. Or maybe you're like, Pastor, I don't want to cheer up. I want to be miserable. I'm here for you this morning. Because today's, this, this morning's sermon 
is I'm going to help you to perfect your misery. All right? Uh, a pastor friend of mine asked me what I was going to preach on this morning. I told him, I said, I'm preaching on perfecting your misery. And he goes, are you going to have a job when you're done? I said, we'll see. Maybe that'll be the sixth thing to add. So if you're here this morning and you want to be miserable, right? Do it, don't do it halfway, all right? I, I want to give you all the, uh, the equipment that you need to be as miserable as you want, all right? So I'm going to give you five ways to be miserable this morning. First one, <laughs> complain about everything. All right, no matter what situation you are, complain about it. And there's always something to find, something to complain about. Now see, if you're not careful, and you don't start complaining, it's easy for joy to start coming in, because some good things will come your way, but don't fall for it. All right? Philippians warns us is to do all these things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. See, the danger comes in if you do not complain enough that in here the joy of the Lord might take a place in you and you might shine in this generation. Right? I mean, if you... If you do everything without complaining and grumbling and in here. He said, look, God, I am your child. That there is that danger that you might shine brightly for him in this crooked and perverse generation. And if you want to be totally miserable, you don't want that. So complain. And see, here, here's the key thing about complaining. All you got to do is find one thing to complain about. Right? In your life, you may have all the, these blessings that come your way. You may have good things happening that you just, but you know what? Ignore those and find the one thing that you can complain about. Just the one thing. That's all it takes. And focus on that one thing, and you too can be an expert complainer. See, the Bible warns us is to let your conduct be without covetousness, be content with such things as you have. For he himself says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so you may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear, what can man do to me? See, if you don't focus on the right thing, you might actually simply go into it and say, you know what, Lord, thank you for what I have. And you will not perfect your misery if you do that. As Christians... See, sometimes it's hard for us to be as miserable as we want to be because the Lord is in us. And we belong to him. I mean, you can take away everything. And Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you. You're not abandoned. You're not alone. He's an ever-present help in the time of trouble. That in here, you, if you're not careful enough and you're not focusing on something that you can complain about, that peace that God is instilling in you might start to grow. So be careful of that. Because that will hinder you from being as miserable as you want to be. Number two. Right? First, complain. Right? Always complain. Second thing, keep track of grievances. Right? Go through your list as often as as you can, so you do not forget all those things. Because you know, we're, some of you will get together for the holidays, and uh, you'll get together with relatives maybe you haven't seen for a while. And, but remember what they did 20 years ago to you? Remember what they said about you, or you thought they said, or maybe you weren't invited somewhere? Take all those things back up. And be willing to throw that out. Right? So in any conversation that you have, be willing to turn around and say, you oh, oh yeah? And start backtracking 30, 40, 50, 60 years of history. Right? All have that ahead of time. Because the Bible says, what? Love is patient 
and is kind. Love is not jealous, does not boast, or is proud or rude, and does not demand its own. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustices or rejoice whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith. Love, always hopeful, endure through every circumstances. See, the problem is, as Christians, the love of God has been placed in us. And so in here, we are predestined to love people. And because we love them, we are patient with them. We are not irritated by them. Let me tell you something. You will not be perfectly miserable until you are irritated by all those around you. And he, one of the goals of that, he says what? Keeps no track or keep no record of wrong. Keeps no track or record of wrong. See, God wants you to throw away that list of things. And forgive and then forget. Bury the hatchet. And forget where you buried it. And by doing that, love will reign in your heart. But you don't want that. You want to be miserable. So keep track of everything that someone has done that's wrong. Right? It doesn't matter how petty. It doesn't matter how long ago. It was funny. We were in, in, in a church... And uh, a, a lady came up, and, and she told me, she goes, Pastor, the Bible says I have to love you, but I do not have to like you. And she goes, and I don't like you, but I love you in Christ. And I kind of looked at her and said, I don't, I don't know how you do that. But let me tell you something, she was on her way to perfecting her misery. And she came to church, and then after every church service, this went on for probably, what, two years, she, uh, she would approach me, with a list. She would sit with her bulletin, and maybe I, I don't want to give you any ideas, but she sat there with her bulletin and wrote down every word I mispronounced, she, everything I misspoke, and, she, and, and you guys listen to me, right? Um, believe it or not, English, actually American is my first language, I don't even speak English, and uh, you know, I, I slaughter the language, and so you can imagine after talking for a half hour, she had a long list, and she had both sides of her bulletin with every error that I made when I preached. And then on the way out of church, she would hand it to me. And I said, thank you. In a couple of weeks, she wasn't in church. And with the wonder of the internet, she was able to watch online. And, then, and halfway through, because I thought it was kind of free, because, oh, she's not here this week. So I'm, and, uh, but no, she would listen to the sermon. And guess what? I would get an email with everything that I had said wrong. And she felt needed to correct me. And she came to church not with a joyful attitude, but she was extremely miserable, and her goal was to make me miserable as well by keeping track of all the wrongs that I had done. If you want to truly perfect your misery... You can't forgive. You can't overlook. See not, see, not only is it the idea of things that need to be forgiven, right? Sometimes we are wronged. But sometimes there are just things that, about that person that irritates us. Proverbs tells us, The discretion of a man makes him slow to anger, and his glory is to overlook a transgression. See, here the call goes forth that for us to overlook people's faults. And you can't help it that you're not, everyone's perfect like you are. And so if you want to perfect your misery, I want to encourage you to start nitpicking at everyone's faults. And, and, and this is extremely easy, you know why? Because everyone has them. You know, Thanksgiving, you, know, you practice this week. Thanksgiving's coming up, and I want you to be well prepared to be miserable. And so this week, just start nitpicking. You know, if things are too salty, or things are too peppery, or maybe it's not hot enough, or maybe it's, right? Start, start on small things. 
and work your way up so that when Thanksgiving comes, you can be totally miserable as much as you want. Be careful of the thought process. Because you allow yourself to think of good things. Philippians, Paul, Paul told them, he said, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. If you want to perfect your misery, you dare not count your blessings. Don't allow positive thoughts to come in. Don't say thank you. Don't be appreciative for what you have. Because that will take away from your misery. Number three. So you follow following me so far? Are you taking notes? If you want to perfect your misery, what? Complain about everything. Keep track of all the grievances. Speak negative words. Speak negative words. Here, here are some tips for you to... Bring these things into your conversation. Talk about how horrible things are. Right? The weather, oh, it's horrible. Oh, the politicians, oh, that, that's horrible too. Oh, traffic, oh, man, that was so bad. Right? You, you see where I'm going. Work, try to work these ways into your conversation. How bad things are. Always, and actually, I, I should have done always or never, right? And you know how this works, right? You know, I always get the smallest piece of pie. I never win. Everyone's always out to get me. And you generalize, right? Because by using the word always, it's, you know, you know, my kids never listen to me. I never get my way, right? You, you see how you do that? Because I mean, you know, we all know that's not true. It's not always the case. By throw, throwing out that word, it generalizes everything, and we can wrap everything all up in one miserable mess. Talk about how things are unfair. And that one's really good, too, because that's sort of this abstract type for because what exactly is fair? So everything can be unfair. I don't get my way. That's unfair. Talk about how stupid things are. <laughs> In here, work these things into your conversations as much as you can. If you want to be perfectly miserable. See, Paul warns us in Ephesians, he says, don't use foul or abusive language and let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. See, if you're not careful with your words, you actually might encourage someone. You might uplift someone. If you realize in not using the word always, there may be some good things. Well, Wait a minute, uh oh, wait, that, that, that will lessen your misery level quite substantially if you do that. So you want your words to be sharp and harsh. Be blunt. And through that, you will not only be perfecting your own misery, but guess what? You will share your misery with others. And isn't that what Thanksgiving's all about? Five ways to be perfectly miserable. Complain about everything. Keep track of all the grievances. Speak negative words. And find miserable friends. Now, at first this may seem difficult to do, but guess what? There are miserable people all over, all around you. And what you'll find is by showing your negativity, uh, in here of showing your misery, you will attract other miserable people. Right? They will find you. I remember I went down to Liberty University, went down to the college there, and in orientation, a huge college, you know, 5,000 students or something like that. And uh, I remember the dean of students addressing the student body, and he said, look, if you are here to live for the Lord, to honor the Lord, you will find other 
Christians, and you will attract them. You don't have to go out and look for them. You will attract other Christians who have that goal. But if you are here to be rebellious, if you are here to cause problems, if you're here to cause trouble, you will attract people of like mind. He goes, it's amazing. Now you can turn around, and within just a few months, and all these people, all of a sudden you'll have people of like mind will attract each other. And if you are truly miserable, you've been working on this list. Pastor, I listened to you. This is the one sermon I kept notes on. You will attract other miserable people that will help drag you down where you want to be. A good example of this is the book of Job. Job lost it all. He lost all of his possessions. He lost his family. He lost his health. And in the middle of that misery that he was going through, the, I mean, the Bible says he would pick on the sores with a broken pot of a, a jar. The dogs would come and lick his wounds. When you thought he couldn't get any lower, Job had not just one friend, but he had three friends. And in here, they wanted to tell Job all the things they thought he did wrong and why he deserved what he got. See, his friends weren't encouraging him. His friends were not comforting him. His friends were, what, adding to his misery. Until finally, after Job, I always say Job is one of the world's longest, shortest books. Because I always think of the book of Job, you know, God's hell saying, hey, if you consider Job, and Job gets zapped, and then you fa fast forward, and then Job, God shows up to Job, and then it's end. But there's a whole 20-some chapters in the middle where Job is contending with his friends, and his friends keep pointing the finger at him and keep running him down. And finally, in chapter 16, this is Job. He says, And I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters are you. If you want to be truly miserable... Find miserable friends. Find complainers. Find someone who's already perfected their misery. And hang out with them. And you might pick up a few tips along the way. But they will feed you in your misery. Most of all, I do want to warn you. Avoid church. Because you might be accidentally blessed. See, what happens is, and sometimes we can't help it. You, you want to be miserable and... You want to find miserable pen, but you come to the church and you find people who are, are excited and love the Lord. People who are thankful. Be careful, because that may rub off on you. And you might get together in, in a service and, and oh, you might enjoy the song. You may find yourself tapping your foot, humming along. And if you are not careful, you will undo all the misery that you've kind of compounded upon yourself. And you have to start all over again. That you may find people who do love you. Who do care for you. And you have to wrestle with that. Or you might find out as you deal with other people. This is an amazing thing that happens is, you know, if I truly want to be miserable, the best thing I can do is be by myself. And it's not because you think, right? Pastor, I don't want you around if you're miserable, right? So I'm, I'm shining. No, 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 no. It's for my own sake. If I want to perfect my misery, the best thing I can do is sit at home and, and get caught up in my own head. And talk to myself about how miserable I am, how bad things are, how no one cares. I have to get caught up and then I can go through all these things in my head. Because if I get out and I start looking at other people, I might realize some things, that things aren't as bad. The book of Hebrews tells us, and not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see that day approaching. Look, as we go forward and, and we serve the Lord, as we come together as a church, that we are in this together and there is encouragement that happens when you get together with other Christians. And if you want to be truly miserable, the last thing you want is encouragement to mess that up for you. And as I work and serve other people, 
focus will start to be taken off myself and onto others. And you got to be careful of that because that will start bringing joy into your life. See, because the last key to truly perfect your misery is to stay self-centered. It's all about me, 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 me. But if I start thinking about other people, a couple things. One, I realize, you know, people aren't as bad. That there's kindness and there's goodness around me. There are people who love me. Also, sometimes you might realize that people are worse off than you are. Now, this is interesting. And there, there's a, there's a, a song or there's a, a phrase that talks about, you know, I felt bad about having no shoes until I met someone who had no feet. I don't know if that's a song or... That would be a weird song. It's been said. If not, I just said it. But we're in Bible school. It's interesting. We, we started calling, uh, you know, we'd get together for, for prayer, and people would go, talk about someone they're going through, and we'd always say that someone always had the ministry of, of no feet. And what that means is that sometimes as you get together with, other, with people and you start talking about things, you realize, you know what, someone is worse off than you. As you look around, someone is sicker, someone else is having more struggles, or maybe someone's having more financial issues, right? We look around, we look at, man, that things aren't so bad for me because it's worse for someone else. Well, wait a minute. If you start going down that road, you're taking your eyes off you, and you will not be miserable. But the goal of the sermon is to help you in your misery. I want to help you to be the most miserable person that you can be. Perfect it. So don't think about other people. Get caught up in your own life and, and you know, develop the, the world's smallest pity party because it's just you. See, Philippians says that each one of you look not only on his own interests but on the interests of others. See, God knows as I go through and I start looking at other people and I start encouraging other people and I start ministering to other people, that brings joy into my life. And you can't have misery and joy at the same time. So I'm here to try to help you this morning. You know, as we wrap up this sermon, it's probably a sermon, I, I don't think I've ever preached a sermon quite like this before. I told my pastor, I'm preaching about perfecting your misery, and hopefully I gave you enough tips to help you be as miserable as you want to be. Of course, by now, we're a half hour into this, and hopefully you realize that all of this is really tongue-in-cheek. But I wanted to be observed this morning to bring home the point. Because it's so easy for us to fall into the misery game. And so the goal is really to be not perfecting our misery. And if you kept track of all this, there's one simple solution to this. Just add the word don't to everything I just said. It's really that simple. God doesn't want you to be miserable. He doesn't want you to wallow in it. He wants to give you his joy, his peace his comfort, and all these things. So all these points, if you just go back and if you put the word don't in front of it, you will have a great thanksgiving. So don't complain about everything. Folks, we have so much to be thankful for. Don't keep track of all grievances. Leave it in the past. Leave it there. You don't have to bring up and hash everything over the last 20 years, even the last two years, the last three years. Let it go. There was a ladies' group in my last church, and they, they call it, use it the toilet 
philosophy. And I was like, what in the world's that? And they're like, just flush it. I was like, you know, I kind of like that. It's kind of crude, so I won't say that from the pulpit. But I think some of us just need to take some of the stuff in our life and just flush it. Don't speak negative words. You know, I was writing this all out, and I was thinking of John Maddox. And he always reminded me, he goes, it's just as easy to lift someone up as it is to tear them down. Bring encouraging words, uplifting words. Don't fall in the trap of always and never. And Don't find miserable friends. Now, I'm not saying don't be friends with miserable people, but don't get them so close enough that you catch what they have. You know, I've used this illustration before, but with your friends and environments that you're in, you know, are you a noodle or are you a pepper? And this is my, you know, you guys know I like spicy food. And, and so I love this illustration. And so as long as I'm here, I'm going to bring this every once in a while. For me, it just makes perfect sense. So I apologize if this doesn't work for you. But this time of year, I, I love, I, I don't know if anyone had a Vietnamese soup called pho or pho. My daughter raised her hand. Okay, she, that's my kid. If you ever get a chance, it's a, it's a Vietnamese soup, comes in a big bowl, and it has rice noodles in it. And it's funny because you throw the rice noodles in there, and they all kind of limp and kind of fold around. They really don't taste like anything. And one of the things I like to put, it's kind of like a, a beef broth type of noodle. It's really nice, warm, in cold days. But I like to put jalapeno peppers in it. And it's funny because when you put the peppers in there, the, the peppers don't take the taste of the noodle. The peppers have an influence on the noodles, and now the peppers taste, you know, permeates everything. If you are in a situation, ask yourself, am I a noodle? Am I taking on and absorbing all the flavors around me? Am I becoming just like all those people? Then you need to get out of that situation. But if you're a pepper and God has put you there to, to flavor everyone else, if you are there and you're able to uplift and encourage, if you can have an influence, then maybe the Lord has you there because someone else is working on their misery. But ask yourself, am I, a, am I a pepper or am I a noodle? And your circumstances may be different in each one. But am I being influenced or am I being an influence? But don't surround yourself. Come to church. Come to Bible study. Be around God's people. And lastly, don't stay self-centered. The worst place that you can get stuck is right here. Thinking about things and dwelling things and mulling things over, and you can create your whole miserable world right here. And the best solution is that to get out. There used to be a, a, a song we learned in Sunday school, J-O-Y, J-O-Y, that must surely mean Jesus first, yourself last, and others in between. You want to be miserable? Listen to me sing. But focus on the Lord and serve other people. And put yourself last, and there is joy in that. And you will find out that, you know what, maybe some things aren't in your life aren't as bad as you thought. Or maybe it's not as hopeless as you think. So in here, I'll probably have a talk with the deacons, they'll probably fire me. Well, this morning, I, I, I just met so many people who are just so content in being miserable. And it's easy for me to fall into that. So hopefully this morning, uh, the twist of this all kind of woke you up a little bit to realize we're called to joy and we're called to thanksgiving. So I pray this thanksgiving will be a time of joy for you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, help us to be thankful for what we have. Lord, help us to have the joy of the Lord in our lives. Lord, help us to not be miserable. Lord, that is so easy in the flesh. But Lord, give us your peace. At this season, we can reflect and truly have a thanksgiving what it's supposed to be. Not about the turkey, not about the pie but truly to have a time to stop and say thanks. 
And we ask this in your name.